for this evening and to see you all take part in the the chanting of the mantra as you heard earlier the mantra man means the mind and truth resting or freeing the mind so it has an interesting effect the mind we give an analogy to understand the potency of the mantra and the analogy is well I had the experience myself when I was in India I lived in India for some time when I was uh, beginning my spiritual journey and uh, I met a uh, one lady what happened was the, the person I was with contacted jaundice and I happened to mention to the local man I was speaking to that my friend has got jaundice and he said oh that's no problem he said we have a lady here she she can immediately get him freed of the jaundice so I was interested to know what was going to happen so my friend and I went but with this man to meet this one lady, an elderly lady who had some mystical powers, or so it seemed that she must have, because all she did was she took a glass of water with a couple of two pieces of wood and she chanted some mantra. And she said, okay, now you'll be all right. And he was. Immediately after that, there was no more problem. He was cured. This lady had some sound, man, the power of the mantra, acted against the disease of the liver, and he became cured. Another time, I was still in India. I was living this time in one of our temples, which was in a remote area near to the Ganga. Mother Ganges, the holy river. And there's a lot of snakes around. It was, you know, jungle-like area. And we had a school. There were some young boys there. And one of the young boys was bitten by a snake. But it had happened before. It, it wasn't a new thing. It was something which happened you know, now and again. You, you know, children are there, and snakes are there, and the snake has that nature that they bite, and they they have poison. So when one of the children was bitten by the snake, we would take him to a neighboring village where there was a elderly Mohammedan man residing, and he knew the mantra to counteract the poison. And he chanted the mantra, and the boy was cured. While the poison was in his body, he was sleeping. He was in a comatose state. But with the sound of the mantra, he came up, became awake, and the effects of the poison was removed. So mantra, sound vibration works like that. It counteracts the the poison which is within our system. Poison is something like jaundice. You know? We have a, ja a jaundice condition. We, you could call it materialism because we're in the material world and we're in a very material environment but we can overcome that environment, the effect of that environment, by the power of mantra, sound vibration. Sound is the finest element in the material creation. In the Vedas, which is where the yoga and mantra comes from, it all comes out of Vedic knowledge, the Vedas describe to us that there are five basic elements in the material creation. Earth, water, fire, air, ether. Different from Chinese medicine. Any of you Chinese medicine? Study Chinese medicine? Chinese medicine, they have also some elements, but different from the Veda. 
sense, but something similar. Ayurveda and Chinese medicine, very similar, same principles. So mantras, very powerful. Of course you have Chinese mantras, right? Om Mi Tofu, Om Mani Padmi Hum, different traditions, different sects, they have different mantras. There are different mantras, different powers, and they all have different strengths. They recognize the strength of sound. Sound, I said, is the finest element. It, 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 it is the beginning of creation. Everything comes from sound. That's actually a Christian statement in the Christian Bible. So in the beginning, what? Huh? It was the word. Yes, right. In the beginning was the word. And everything comes from sound. Sound is the beginning. Sound is the finest element. Sound exists in ether. Ether means there's no air. Take everything out. You're left with space. Is there anything there? There's only one thing can, vi can be vibrating that. That is sound. So it's the subtlest element. It's the beginning of the creation. From sound, after sound, then next comes air. But with air, then there's a sensation of touch, as well as sound. And then after air, then next element will be fire. And with fire, you have form, as well as touch, as well as sound. And then next element is water. Water has taste. Bhagavad Gita. In Bhagavad Gita, it says, I am the taste in water. So water has taste, as well as form, and sound, and touch. This all, fine, and finally, earth. With earth, I am the original fragrance of the earth. From the earth comes the aroma, or the fragrance, as well as all the other activities, the the taste, the form, the uh, <coughs> touch, and the sound. So this is how creation comes about. It all comes from sound, the finest element. Sound is so crucial for us. People can go mad by, because of sound. It can drive people mad. Uh, as a chanter of Hare Krishna, sometimes people come to me and say, if you don't stop chanting, I'm going to go mad. <laughs> <laughs> but actually the, the effect of the chanting, the mantra which we are chanting, the Maha Mantra here, it's called Maha Mantra, meaning Great Mantra. Great Mantra in the sense that anyone can chant it. There's no qualification for any. Anyone can do it. You don't have to be initiated, you don't have to be like me, you don't have to be a monk or anything. Anyone, in any condition of life, they can chant this mantra and they can be benefited. What benefit? The benefit is that it awakens the consciousness. As I said, person bitten by a snake is in a comatose condition, they're asleep. But they're brought back to life by the mantra, by the sound of the mantra. In the same way, we are in a sleeping condition. We're asleep as to our original spiritual nature. And the chanting of this mantra will bring back that consciousness. It will awaken, it will vital, revitalize our consciousness. That consciousness is there within us, but it's become covered over. It's, be it's fallen asleep, you could say. We have to waken up. Wake up, right? How do you, how do you wake up? Somebody calls you, you know. <laughs> you have to get up, you have to go, you have to go to work, you have a class or something. So, this sound again wakes us. So sounds, different sounds have different effects. And the sound of this mantra, this effect is 
to awaken our consciousness, to bring us back to our spiritual nature. Spiritual nature, meaning understanding more about our identity, the sense of identity, who I am, understanding ourselves as a spiritual being, not just simply as the body. The body is the dress, and within the body is the living force. Consciousness comes from the, the soul. Without the soul, it's a dead body. The soul is what gives life to the body. And the, the soul has consciousness. And that consciousness is spread throughout the body. But the consciousness is covered. It's dormant. Our real spiritual consciousness is dormant. But it is revived by the chanting of the mantra. We wake up to our spiritual identity. This is the idea behind the mantra meditation. And this particular mantra is the Maha Mantra, the great mantra. It's available for everyone, any, anyone, anywhere. We can chant and can be benefiting. Any time and any place. There's no rules, there's no regulations on it. And wh why particularly is Hare Krishna? So many nice melodies we were hearing Prabhu this evening. So absorbing, it's so pleasing to hear the chanting. And there's an unlimited number of tunes and melodies which the mantra can be used to sing. And sometimes in different parts of the world, you know, they have different tunes, different melodies, and we will sing according to the place. But it's up to the, the, the individual chanting. Everyone can chant as they like. There's no rules. It's open for everyone. But you have to use the tongue to chant. And the louder you chant, the more powerful it becomes. You can feel the atmosphere change, how the, the whole atmosphere in the room becomes transformed with spiritual energy when the chanting is taking place. It's the effect of the mantra. We don't feel any anxiety, we don't feel troubled when the sound vibration is going on. So. We encourage all of you, you know, you, you can try this chanting for yourself. You can do it anytime, any place. In the shower, <laughs> you can chant. In the day, in the night, anytime. And anyone can do it. And you can feel an awakening in consciousness. That consciousness is to understand ourselves as a spiritual being, not just simply as the body, but as a soul living in the body. This is the awakening of consciousness, to understand that I'm something different from the body. We want to transcend the material energy. And trans transcendence comes as soon as you begin to chant. If you have any problems, you have any troubles, you have any anxieties at all, just simply chant. Take shelter of this, this mantra and you will feel immediately relief from all the problems. This is the effect. All right, are there any questions? I have a question. First of all, um, lovely to see you. Thank you so much for coming. We, thanks for bringing everyone together on a Friday night. Perfect. My, my, my question is, uh, you're talking about the vibration of the mantra. Um, what does the uh, Bhagavad Gita say about vibration of food? The food that we, we live in a food paradise. It's really quite nice. 
Um, what's the guidance around food and what it what it means mm -hmm. to to follow uh, you know, that path? Well, yes, good question. Yeah, material nature is described from Bhagavad Gita that material nature is classified in three divisions. What we would call goodness, passion, and ignorance. Now, chanting mantra, by the way, the mantra is to actually overcome the, this material nature and to come to transcendence. Transcendence is above all that material energy, above even goodness. But when we're talking about food, food is in three different divisions. You have food in goodness, in passion, and in ignorance. Food in ignorance, for example, is food which is like animal flesh and things like that. It's, it's impure, it's decayed, it's full of blood and things. And food in the mode of passion is food which is highly uh, pungent, maybe very a lot of spices in it, very strong spicy, or, or something maybe very sweet and very oily, that kind of food, but that would be more passion or rajas, as they say. And food in the mode of goodness is food which will be healthy, which will give you longer life, which will give you better health and give you energy and uh, food which will at the same time satisfy you also. It's not that we have to starve, you know, rather there's a yoga diet and the yoga diet is to eat foods like, like fruit and grains and vegetables uh, and these things should be fresh. And in this way, you eat foods which are nourishing and tasty, you feel healthy, you get energy, and it has a good effect on the mind also. Sometimes it's said, do you eat to live or do you live to eat? It's an interesting question. Do we eat to live, or do you live to eat? We should ideally eat to live. So we do want to be quite careful. But at the same time, as I said, chanting, mantras can be done by anyone. You, you, you can eat any kind of foods, and you can still chant and be benefited. Because it's transcendental. But food, it, it's important. And the, you're giving f food tonight? Yeah? It will be vegetarian, right? It's not going to be, it's not going to be a beef burger. Or anything. <laughs> you know. hmm. Yeah, yes? I have a question. Uh, what does Hare Krishna actually mean? Hare means spiritual energy. And Krishna means the all-attractive person, referring to a person. Rama also means a, 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 a person who is the reservoir of all pleasure, all enjoyment. Just like you, Londro Rama, <laughs> you, I used to go to the laundrette, Londro Ra, Rama, they put a Rama, super, you know, Rama, Rama at the end, a place of pleasure, you know, a place where you enjoy. So Rama is actually referring uh, to there was a great king, King maybe, Rama. From yeah, Ramayana. maybe. Yeah, yeah, they just opened that. Okay, so that I have another question. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's Krishna and there's Rama, and uh, we chant their names, uh, and uh, this is called the mantra, right? Yeah. But uh, that's like, is there like a, a feminine side to it? Yes, there's, there's a feminine like, side. Uh, mess, like, they're both male kings uh, that we're... Mm. But Hare, Hare is the feminine side. Okay. Hare represents uh, the, the, the feminine side. Of, I hear people say uh, Radhe Krishna a lot, uh, but... We say Hare Krishna. Okay. Okay. Hare is the feminine side. Right. Yes. 
And there's, there's no difference between chanting, for example, Radha Krishna and Hare Krishna. Hare is referring to the energy, the, the spiritual energy. And Rama can also refer to Krishna. It doesn't have to just simply refer to Lord Rama, who, who th th appeared much long time before Krishna. They're just re, uh, uh, reincarnations of each other. Yes, right. Uh, like that. The avatars. We yeah, see right. avatars. Yes. So ra there's Rama. There's also other Ramas. There's Parasurama. Yes. And there's Balarama. Yes. But Rama can also be a name of Krishna. It has uh, different in 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 intention. In fact, the, the chanter, how you're chanting. Even you don't know the meaning of the mantra, but still you can be benefited by the mantra. You don't have to know the meaning. But just, I, I used to sing the mantra myself. I didn't know the meaning, anything about it, but I used to sing the mantra. It was a popular recording. It was on the, you know, on the radio waves. And, and you know, when I, I was a student at the time, and I remember chanting. A lot I used to chant. I didn't know the meaning of the mantra at all, but I did like to chant. And I think it definitely benefited me later on. It brought me into this path. And there's a big difference between uh, saying it out loud and saying it in the mind without moving the mouth? Yes, there is. To try to say it in the mind is something very challenging. Because the nature of the mind is such that the mind is restless. Yeah. We try to chant in the mind, how long can we focus on something in the mind? Yeah. So trying to do silent chanting, it's not encouraged in this age. In, in Bhagavad Gita, for example, uh, it's d described Arjuna was being instructed in yoga and he was told to, to do a certain meditation. He said, well, I can't do it. He said, my mind is restless. It's more turbulent than the wind. I can't do it. So that, that was 5,000 years ago. So what to speak of today, our condition. Arjuna was a great soul. You know, he was a, from a royal family. He was a Maharati. He was uh, conceived by the Seman of Indra, the king of heaven. But he, even he said, I can't control my mind. So trying to control the mind is something very difficult. But sound vibration makes it easier to control the mind. If you have a sound, the sound vibration is there, then it's much easier to focus our concentration on that. So as I said, the louder you chant, the more powerful it becomes. And uh, so when, when I'm just listening and absorbing it, versus me also joining in and uh, chanting. Uh, is there a big difference? Well, it depends how much you're concentrating on hearing the mantra. Right. Okay. Everything depends on the attitude. Certainly, you can just simply hear. You don't have to chant. You can just simply listen to the chanting and be greatly benefited but you want to be fully absorbed and concentrate on that medi and you know as we say meditation fixing the mind hearing hearing carefully and then you certainly you'll be greatly benefited so it's not just only the the people who chant but the hearers also benefit but everything depends on the attitude what is our mood in chanting or in hearing. We have to give the full concentration and then you get the maximum benefit. Thank you. Maharaj, could you explain to us like the 16 words put together, what do they mean? Well, Hare, as they said, Hare is the energy. So Krishna, Krishna and Rama, you see, like Lord Shiva, he comes with his wife Parvati, and Lakshmi comes with Lord Narayan, and the same way you have Krishna with Radha, 
or Sita is with Rama. You see, so the, the, the form of the Lord comes with his energy, the feminine part. And the, the, the feminine part. So Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. It's actually put together in this form. It's a prayer. You could, you could say it's a prayer. And at the same time, it's the answer to the prayer. Because it's a, the prayer is to, to the Lord that we can be engaged in his service. And by chanting the mantra, we're actually engaged. We're connecting to the service of the Lord. There's a saying, uh, and it's said in the scriptures, <coughs> Naham tishtani vai kunte yoginam rudayeshuva tatra tishtani narada yatra gayanti mampata. Lord Krishna spoke this, this verse, and he is saying that I am not in the hearts of the yogis who meditate on me. You know, the yogis often sit in meditation and they're meditating on the Lord in the heart. So, Lord Krishna says, I am not in the heart of these yogis meditating. And I'm not in the Vaikuntha. Vaikuntha means the spiritual realm, which is, we would call it like the kingdom of God, you know. But he said, I'm not there. I am wherever my devotees like Narada are chanting my name. So Lord Krishna gave importance to the people who will chant his name, that he's attracted to that person who is inclined to chant his name. So we're calling to Krishna that, you know, it just like, when, Krishna, please come. I want to see. So when you chant the name of Krishna, then you can feel the presence of Krishna. Krishna can actually come. There. And it's said like Krishna dances on the tongue of the person who chants his name. You can actually feel the transformation as you begin to chant. It, it becomes a habit. It becomes, some, you could say, addictive even. But the benefit is very great. As we say, the benefit is the consciousness changes. We awaken our spiritual identity. Yes? So uh, I have a question. So if we are using this in the practice of Japa Mala, uh, which is like the Japa Mala, you know, like the concentration and everything. So how do we attain absolute blissful concentration, which is samadhi using the mantra? Because sometimes when you're reciting the mantra and then that thoughts coming in, a lot of distraction. So how do we attain that absolute samadhi? Are you chanting? Japa? Yes. Yeah, you do? Okay, good. How many rounds do you chant? Um, uh, I, I do it for an hour, so like... Oh, very good. Yeah. Yes, that for those of you who don't know, Japa is what, you know, like here I have a bag and in my bag I have beads. And we chant on wooden beads, and we, we use the beads to count. The beads are used to count and to engage the sense of touch. You hold the bead in your hand, and you chant one mantra on the bead, then you go to the next bead, like that. So that is called japa. We were doing earlier, that is, this is kirtan. Kirtan is with the instruments, but japa is an individual thing. Kirtan is with the group. We're all together and we're all chanting. But japa is our own personal meditation on the mantra. We chant the mantra. And uh, Prabhu is asking about the difficulty in focusing the mind when we chant japa. Because, of course, as I said, the mind does wander. And even though, I, of course, if you do silent japa, then the mind wants wandering a lot. But when you chant aloud, then your mind has something to focus on. So we use the tongue to chant and the ear to hear. 
it's not a question of the mind. You have to put your full concentration into hearing the mantra. You want to hear all the syllables of the mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, right? We, we, <laughs> we want to try to chant the mantra so that we can really focus on that sound of the mantra. And this is how we absorb the mind. And in Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna was saying, I can't do it, my mind is restless, worse than the wind. But Lord Krishna, he did not accept. Lord Krishna said, no. He said, abhyasena tu kontiya. He said, by practice it's possible. By constant practice and detachment. So abhyasa and vairagya. These two things are required. Detachment. You have to let go. Let go of all of those things which are coming in your mind. And just focus on the, the mantra. Hear the mantra. Then you get the real fe a benefit of the mantra. Right? We are holding on to these things. We're letting our mind go. We're thinking, oh, what have I got to do today? Oh, oh I didn't have breakfast yet. What's going to be for breakfast? And so many thoughts will come in the mind. You have to put them aside. You have to. Now is my time for japa. I want to hear the mantra. Focus on the mantra. It's a meditation. Mantra meditation. So it takes practice. So more japa. You do more, more chanting. And, and chant louder. And you can get more benefit. Okay. Um, thank you, Maharaj, for giving us a small talk that um, he's a traveling yogi. So we're very blessed that he happens to be in Singapore on the day that we have our kirtan. So we kind of just stole his time and got him to be here. So thank you, Maharaj, for coming. And also thank you all of you for spending your Friday night here where really you could be anywhere else but here. But you choose to be here with us. Um, we are a group of volunteers who are in this practice and we just want to share the joy, share the practice. So thank you for coming. Otherwise, we will be like lonely. <laughs> it's just the few of us. So thank you for giving, uh, being here and giving us a purpose to share the practice. So we all need like some kind of purpose and meaning in life, right? To keep us going. Otherwise, it feels very... We're very lost, like we can't be just here on earth um, getting a paycheck and then off it goes the next day <laughs> out to your bills. There must be something more in life and um, with this connection that we have, this friendship and this practice that we are sharing, um, that's where we slowly figure out where are we heading to in life, hopefully. So um, so we run this uh, every first Friday of the month. Uh, um, um, except for three months, the rest of the months are here in Mindful Space. So next month we are in um, Little India, a yoga studio called uh, Ashtanga Yoga Nilayam. Um, they have invited us to be there in their space um, to put things up. So uh, you will receive my email blast once a month telling you like here is the sign up link for the upcoming month. Uh, I don't usually send reminders, so if you miss the email, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't want to spam, so I usually only send once a month. Uh, but I will, after you sign up, I will send you a reminder like, hey, you sign up for this, remember to come. If you're not coming, please let us know. Um, thank you for coming. I think this is the best turnout we ever have. I think we have like 40 people in the room. So thank you for turning up. <laughs> purely by donation if you like to and only if you want to feel free to drop us a donation um, at the reset table in front you can drop cash or if you are going to pay now um, please put the word kirtan in the remarks so that I know it's for um, this purpose um, yes and can we get a group photo um, it may go up on social media but I will like put some filter it will not look like you that much <laughs> so, um, so can we all like uh, can oh, actually can you all just